This is North Dakota Legislative Review. I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us. I'm very excited to welcome our special guest today, Governor Doug Burgum. Governor, thanks for being here. Great to be here, Dave. Uh, since, we're, since we're talking this week, the legislature has gone on crossover. I want to get into that in just a minute. But this is also the week where the protesters at the camp near Cannonball were given a deadline to leave. Uh, as we're sitting here, how is this going now? Well, as of uh, right now, which happens to be uh, Thursday afternoon, uh, mid-afternoon, I uh, just received word that uh, the camp, the Ochetti camp, has been secured. So really for the first time uh, since the process started, we are now, uh, at least in terms of Morton County, no longer have any ungoverned land uh, in North Dakota, whether it's on, uh, on, the, on federal land or any other land. And so that's a big milestone. Uh, today, at least so far, before we stepped into the studio here, about 33 arrests were made today. All of those uh, were accomplished uh, peacefully. And so we uh, feel very good about the fact that now we can have uh, full access to continue the cleanup work that we've been initiating the last couple of weeks. And so with the Army Corps of Engineers in there today, we're already in the process of uh, going through buildings, taking down structures. There was dozens and dozens of buildings that have been built in the floodplain uh, that need to be removed. Six months of, of uh, human waste and garbage and abandoned vehicles that had to be removed. They're getting some cars out of there this afternoon. Uh, with the big, uh, you know, uh, front end loaders with forklifts on them because it's too muddy to try to drive some of these derelict vehicles out of there. But all of this is, you know, great news for the environment because all of this uh, uh, could be leaching right into the Cannonball River and the Missouri, system, Missouri River system. And so, uh, you know, and we, uh, everybody in North Dakota is on the clean water team. And so, uh, huge kudos to law enforcement, the work they've done yesterday during the, the deadline and the evacuation and the assistance we provided to move people uh, out of the area. And then uh, again today on the, with the final closing down of the camp, it's uh, again uh, tremendous work by, by law enforcement. And of course now, the, now it really focuses on cleanup. It does, uh, and yet there's still uh, some of the protesters have moved across the cannonball uh, into either the Sacred Stone or the Rosebud camp. Uh, so those, those are located on, on some on core land and some on reservation land. Uh, we have had some challenge uh, engaging help from the federal government, but with the camps uh, now there and with the increased presence of uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs agents, which are the folks that provide the law enforcement on Standing Rock Reservation, uh, we'll uh, you know, continue to have some work to do in the weeks ahead uh, to make sure that we can reestablish the rule of law in Sioux County as well as we have in Morton County. So it, it can't be a real fast rolling out thing is what you're saying. Well, I think we're, we're going to move very fast on the camp cleanup on the north side of the Cannonball River, having now secured that, uh, secured that area, and we can move unfettered in terms of the cleanup. So I think that will go quickly. But again, the scale of cleanup required, we've taken over 240 roll-off sized construction dumpster loads out of there already over the past few weeks. Uh, and uh, I expect that they're going to have to take at least that many or more again uh, just to get the material off, and then there's going to have to be soil remediation and cleanup. So there's a lot of work to do in the weeks ahead, but we're also, there's an eviction notice that's been given uh, to the Sacred Stone Camp uh, issued by the BIA. That has four more days left before that, uh, for that notice runs out, and there's a, a separate and different legal process for eviction notices on, on tribal lands, but that legal process will begin to try to uh, make progress on reestablishing the rule of law on the Sioux County side of the river. And as you mentioned, we're all a part of the clean water team and I know the real concern is flooding and also potential pollution of the Missouri and Lake Oahe. Yes. Yeah, and, it, and it's ironic, you know, this began with the idea of, uh, of water protection was the first cause that was on the, uh, that was part of the, the protest movement. And, you know, the closest municipal water intake uh, to downstream from six months of all this garbage is, of course, the Fort Yates uh, and rural Sioux County water system. And so that, that's, uh, you know, one again where, you know, we want to make sure we get this cleaned up before, uh, you know, buildings, cars, propane tanks, garbage, human waste, you know, finds its way uh, down towards anyone's municipal water intake. So you've had to deal with this, like, from day one almost. Yes. Of your, of your administration. Yes. Yeah, and, it, and it's been uh, interesting because it's... Uh, uh, you know, the many facets of the thing has uh, put our office uh, in close touch with uh, all aspects of law enforcement with our National Guard. Uh, it's presented a unique opportunity to get to know governors from other states as we've requested assistance uh, from other states who've sent uh, sheriff's departments and other to help us out uh, when we weren't able to get support from uh, 
you know, from federal sources, uh, and it's uh, given me a chance to meet a lot of folks uh, in Washington to see it in uh, that are you know running major agencies and and high up higher up level people, including you know Secretary of Armor, Acting Secretaries of Bureau of Interior, people in the White House, Homeland Security, because everybody in Washington D.C. has been involved in watching this, and while they might not have taken action, they've been very interested in what's going on here, and so uh, it's it's been a uh, it's safe to say it's been this just alone has been a full-time job. Are you confident that the federal government's going to step up and pay or help pay for the law enforcement? Well, I think we have some work ahead of us there. As I, my phrase I've been saying to all of our agencies is keep your receipts uh, because we're going to have a, a, a uh, hopefully we'll have a productive discussion. Uh, if, it's, if the discussions aren't productive, our Attorney General Wayne Stengem has indicated his uh, strong willingness to initiate a lawsuit against the federal government for, for reimbursement for the costs we've incurred. I think we break it into two parts. I think the, the cleanup pieces, the cleanup costs, there's a lot of existing resources, FEMA, Army Corps of Engineers, some grant programs. I think those will, uh, those dollars will appear. And we're talking, you know, there could be one to two million dollars that, uh, in the, for the estimated right now in terms of cleanup costs. But we've already spent 33 million on extra law enforcement. And that's a number uh, that I, I think that that's a number where we've advanced that money from the bank in North Dakota to cover those costs. And uh, I've said I'm going to work uh, as hard as I can to make sure that uh, the taxpayers in North Dakota do not have to foot that bill. And the $33 million comes at a time where it's a tight state budget. Yeah, no, the tight state budget is, again, uh, and that's certainly... Uh, certainly the situation, but to put it in historic terms, there's not been any legislature or governor's office in the history of the state that's had to take out uh, a billion and a half dollars out of a general fund effort. And if you know, put that in percentage terms, it's 25% of the, the general fund. And so that's also a record. I mean, we're in relative to uh, where people might have had to take cuts of you know 2% or 5% or even 10%, but never 25%. So this is a very challenging budget environment, but you know, the legislature's working hard, uh, crossover weekend this weekend, and, and I'd say we're, we're on track to uh, achieve that goal, but still be working to deliver the services most important to North Dakotans. That segues nicely into the legislative discussion. At the crossover <coughs> point, are, are you confident that that the legislature will come in close to that number that you're thinking? Uh, I do. I think we've had good, uh, right from the start, uh, I think we've had a good, uh, a good understanding of where we need to get to. Uh, one of the things that will happen here in early March is we'll have a new revenue forecast. Uh, and the revenue forecast, uh, you know, based on what we saw for the December numbers, uh, continue to be challenged because we came up short in a big way on sales tax in December. Uh, some of that could be weather related. Of course, we had all these uh, you know, huge blizzards during the uh, during the shopping season. But you know, when when uh, that time passed, you don't get those you don't get those revenues back in January. So we'll work with the legislature and the revenue forecasting team and make sure that we uh, have the right forecast in place. But that's gonna there's gonna be no relief from a March forecast in terms of bringing dollars back into the budgeting process in the second half of the legislative session. As I've been hearing from legislative leaders, they're saying that the hope they have right now is it isn't any worse than it is now that they're hoping that the, the forecast will be probably close to the, the last forecast that was done. But there are some signs on the horizon that might play out later, and that's the idea of maybe hiring more frac crews to get more oil wells uh, in line, get them, get them finished. And there's some sales tax that goes along with that that might help the sales tax bottom line. But as you said right now, that you, can you factor that in? This is real tough. Yeah, I think it's hard. I mean, we, one thing we learn in the states, very hard to forecast, uh, you know, commodity prices. Uh, but there are, in the near term, some signs of relief. There have, from job service, uh, indication that there have been companies that are out hiring frack crews. I've talked to uh, people in the industry that have indicated, uh, you know, one company said, hey, they're moving their well count from two to six. Uh, that may not seem like a lot when we were so used to big well counts. But let's, let's realize during this downturn, the industry... Uh, has gotten so much more productive in terms of their effectiveness. And so a, a, if it took, used to take 20 to 30 days to drill a well, now they're drilling them in 12 to 15 days. So if we, uh, six, six drilling rigs may be the same as what was 12 four years ago because they're drilling twice as many uh, wells per month. And, and then, of course, we have all these drilled but uncompleted wells, the duck wells as they call them, 
Uh, and uh, with over 800 of those, if those start coming online, th they will drive a lot of sales tax uh, because of uh, all the uh, associated expense associated with opening up a well. But this, this is kind of, you know, you can't do that in a March forecast, perhaps. No, no. And, but again, when we're, again for the, the viewers, uh, what we're trying to forecast is what are the, what are the revenues going to be between, uh, you know, July 1 of 2017 and June 30th of 2019. That's the, you know, the, the forecast for the, for the next biennium that we're looking at. But this legislature also has got to look at the, the forecast between now and June. Uh, because again, there may be the outlook may look better for the two years of the next biennium than it does look for the next uh, for the last few months of this biennium. Right, and that mean people may not realize that that there's still some time left in the biennium. The legislature has some lag time, but by, the, by the by adjournment and when the new budget cycle starts. Yes. So, so that's that all factors in. Yes. I, when you uh, gave your state of the state address, you did talk about reinvention of government. How do you think that's being rolled out in the legislature? Well, I think it's uh, the, what's happening right now when you've got this historic amount of budget cutting is that you have uh, a lot of budgets really getting squeezed. But if you just take a look at the process that we have where individual, individual agencies come before their respective committee and they've got a budget that is really a silo and that legislative committee might be looking at their budget but not looking at another agency or another agency. And so we optimize by squeezing down that budget within that silo, within that committee, and then we roll up all those silos into an overall budget. And, and that's a effective process for getting uh, a billion and a half dollars out of a budget. And that's, that's, that's heavy lifting by itself. But what's missing from that is, let's just take kids under the age of six. Kids under the age of six might show up in a dozen different budgets. And some of those might be cabinet agencies that report to the governor's office. It might be the bank in North Dakota who's got a loan program for daycare. It may be uh, something that's got federal assistance tied to it, like uh, assistance for needy families. Uh, it could be in the uh, Department of Public Instruction where they've got early learning programs. And so these, these budgets show up all over dozens of places, but no one's trying to optimize for a population or a group across all of those. So one of the things that that in my time here coming in as a business guy from the outside is that the process uh, is effective for achieving a budget number. It's not, uh, it's not very productive for reinventing government and it's not productive for, for optimizing across the entire system. And I keep moving my hands horizontally because the dollars aren't moving upstream or downstream in a way that would allow the state to save money. So I have floated out the idea that, uh, that for the executive branch to have, uh, as a trial run, even 1% of the budget. Let's say we take it from $6 billion down to $4.5. Let's have $45 million, not, a, not extra money, it's just 40, the, the budgets all get nailed down, but we have the opportunity over the next two years to move $45 million from one place to another. Because if I can take, you know, out of corrections, it costs us $41,000 a year to incarcerate someone. If I can take you know, five people out of incarceration for a year, I got $200,000 I could spend over here on an addiction program that might keep you people out of jail in the first place. But right now, the way the budgets are wired, no one can move those dollars around. They just have to stay within their own silos. And so we, we have a system uh, which by definition will create a suboptimal solution for the system as a whole. And if we want to reinvent government, if we want to really, as a state, take advantage of, of innovation, there has to be some mechanism between the legislative sessions for dollars to be able to move between the various bu budget buckets. Are your roadblocks to this uh, ennui? Are they uh, just, we've done this thing for so many years and we're not going to try anything new? Or are there rules in the legislative process that might be a hindrance to this? Well, I think it could be all of that. I mean, this is a... Uh, you know, this is a new idea, and we know how new ideas are received. Uh, so, but I think, again, something I've floated out, uh, we haven't, uh, it wasn't something that even I understood fully at the beginning of the legislature. I might have introduced a bill about this uh, at the beginning. But as I'm seeing the, uh, I'm seeing it unfold, I think there may be a way 
with legislative leadership at the end of the session with the final OMB bill just to include uh, a small measure of flexibility as a test to see, to give us a chance as operating business leaders to see if we can continue that improvement process uh, between the legislative sessions. So correct me if I'm wrong, but this sounds like some of the underpinning of the, of the speech that you gave to the Board of Higher Education this week. Well, I, I had a chance, yes, to uh, meet with them. And I think, you know, one of my key messages to higher ed, because they're obviously one of the areas where there's some big cuts uh, that are coming. And, but they're, they're coming uh, at a time when it's not just business as usual, because if you take a look at what's happening in the world, and what's happening in the world is we're undergoing a period of more rapid change than ever before. A lot of that's driven by technology that's disrupting, uh, you know, Every job, every company, every industry is being disrupted by technology. And then I take a look at education and you say, education used to be this thing where you had to go to a place to have knowledge transfer occur. You had to go to a campus where there was a library and there was professors. That's, that's why we've invested so much in the fixed cost of 11 campuses around the, the state. Uh, and whether it's 11 or whether it's one, it do, that doesn't matter. It's just, we've put a lot of money into the fixed cost of those buildings. And it's estimated there could be over a billion dollars of deferred maintenance cost, which is not in this budget, just to maintain those campuses. And then you have the variable cost of paying all the teachers to come there. Well, what's happening you know, in the world now? Knowledge transfer can occur anywhere. And the whole value proposition of, should I go to college for four years, borrow money, pay for tuition, and then get a degree, that value proposition is eroding because the degree may not have the economic value that it used to have. And so uh, the combination of technology, there's been way too much easy money, $1.1 $1 trillion of loans in our country to pay for student loans. Well, that's one of the reasons why tuition has grown faster than inflation because just like we had a housing bubble uh, back in 2008, we've got a higher education bubble because we've pushed all this cheap money at people with the idea that there was a certain return, and there is no certain return uh, from many, many uh, college degrees. And so part of my message to higher education today was, it's not about this year's budget shortfall, it's about the fact that the fundamental proposition of what does higher education actually do in the future, that is under uh, attack, and it's not under attack by, by me or by state government, it's under attack by uh, technology where every citizen has a, a supercomputer in their pocket and every citizen can get knowledge transfer wherever they are, any place, any time, uh, on almost any kind of device. That, it just changes everything. And, and if you take, you know, what kind of institution would be best prepared to deal with rapid change? It would be one that would be nimble, be flexible, uh, you know, understood competition, could move resources around. And what do we have in universities? We've got uh, tradition, we've got culture, we've got alumni, we've got state pro funding processes, we've got tenure, we've got faculty senate, we have all kinds of existing structures that allowed them to exist for hundreds of years. Those fundamental things that resist change structurally in the university system are the kind of things that are going to cause those kinds of institutions to not be successful in a period of rapid change when their fundamental value proposition is under attack. So it's going to be interesting interesting time ahead for all forms of education, K through 12 and university. I think in North Dakota, if we really want to get serious about reinvention, we have to start over with a whole new set of assumptions and try to reinvent the way we deliver, uh, deliver education. And anything short of that is going to be just a, uh, you know, painful attrition uh, as, as alternative forms of knowledge transfer uh, scale up and take higher market share and, and higher education institutions shrink. And already K-12 and some people in the legislature are really pushing this innovation bill for K-12. Then they say it, it would dovetail nicely with, with some of your thoughts about education, especially when one of the speakers at a recent press conference said, you know, I used to teach knowledge in information. Now the kids can get information on their phones, their computers, mm -hmm. whatever device they have. So now the idea is to teach them how to use the information and knowledge and then, you know, do problem solving. So, yep, exactly. so apparently there's, there's, there's some thought about that in K-12 as well. Yeah, and the innovation bill, what I would call that a good start. In my mind, it doesn't go you know, far enough, fast enough, uh, but it's a, it's a good start to, to indicate that there's at least an, an, an acknowledgement that the fundamental aspects of, of, of knowledge transfer are changing in this world, and we're not moving fast enough to keep up with those. And, of course, they always say it takes a while to move the Queen Mary. 
It does. So. And, uh, and, and, but, and that, is, that is absolutely true, but I think it's, again, in a time, uh, as humans, we always tend to think that the future is going to change the way it changed in the past, but it's actually not. You know, the change is accelerating, and so if we apply our own personal experiences to the future, we will us underestimate the rate of change, and institutions, whether it's K-12 through or higher ed or government itself, uh, are going to be in for a, a painful future because the, the world will change faster than those institutions can change. Would it be fair to say that maybe two years from now you'll have more proposals on this for the legislature to look at? Oh, absolutely, we will. And I, I think, again, I mean, it's part of the nature. You get elected two weeks later, the legislature is, you know, is going. Uh, that it, your first session you go through, you're uh, particularly in one with all this cutting, you're, you're playing, you're doing a lot of reacting as opposed to being proactive, but we're certainly uh, uh, already looking forward to the next legislative session where we can be more proactive on laying out proposals. How's your relationship been with the legislative leaders? Well, I think it's been terrific because they're, uh, you know, they got a big hard job to do, and uh, you know, this is a time when everybody comes in, and you know, it's it's just it's not fun to have to say no to everybody, and that's basically what uh, they're doing right now. But we, you know, we started out uh, strong with a overall kind of framework of where we had to get to from a budget, and I think. Uh, the Senate's view of how to get there will be a little different from the House, and uh, we, you know we'll look forward to seeing uh, where it all comes together at the end. But I think it's been very, very positive. And Senator Holmberg said the same thing on the floor: is you'll 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 discuss and and fret about some of the particulars in a budget, but when the day comes down, you're going to have a budget that's very close to what what uh, you recommended. Probably. Yeah, and I and I think what I said earlier, uh, I mean, we could end up thinking. And I think for me to be effective after the legislature leaves, I'm more interested in having some fungibility to move dollars around, some flexibility than I am what the actual number is. I mean, I've sort of I've even said to legislative leaders, uh, you, you pick it, pick a number, uh, and we can work whatever number you end up with, but give us the flexibility, and then then we'll start the reinvention process. I wanted to get in the few minutes we have left to talk about the Main Street Initiative. If you can uh, give us an, a short explanation of that, and then I wanted to follow up by asking, how is this rolling out in the legislature? Well, the first uh, thing just on the Main Street Initiative, which is uh, uh, central to our future as a, as a state, because we know there's some things we have to do. One, we got to diversify the economy. Two, we've got almost 15,000 jobs that are open, and we have to fill those and fill those jobs. And that's that this has been around forever. I mean, since anybody's ever campaigned, which is it's jobs, 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 diversify the economy. What's different right now is in a knowledge-based economy, it really depends on people. I mean, we have all these amazing assets, but even if you're in the oil business, you need petroleum engineers. If you're in the ag business, more and more you need, uh, you know, agronomists with technology backgrounds, not just someone who operates machinery. So we need higher skilled 21st century jobs, even in our existing uh, major industries, and if we want to diversify into value-added energy, value-added uh, agriculture, advanced manufacturing, robotics, UAV, software technology, we need to have a workforce that matches that. And we're not producing enough of those out of our university system, so then to fill those jobs, we have to recruit people to our state. And who are we competing with? We're com if you're competing for millennials, then you're competing for all the cool places that millennials can move to and live. We're also competing for retiring baby boomers who have, may have another five or 10 years in their work life, but they're also a very mobile population. They maybe want to downsize, they want to live in a, in a more interesting, walkable, uh, mixed use environment. And so for these two major demographic moves, which are empty nester baby boomers and millennials that are a key part of the workforce, for us to be successful in competing for those, we have to have vibrant, interesting communities. It's no longer just, if, before if you had a job then, and there was you know, you know, high unemployment across the whole country, you might have, the job might have been filled. But now when you've got relatively low unemployment, uh, we've got low unemployment here, we have to have net in migration. So it all gets back to building interesting communities as well as the great jobs. And so then the Main Street Initiative takes all these aspects, diversifying the economy, uh, filling those jobs, building interesting communities, because they all are all tied together. And then how do we do that? It's going to be a series of legislation over the next few years, but it, it starts with keeping things like the Renaissance Zone, very successful legislation, keeping that going. Uh, but it touches everything from, you know, job service, it touches the DOT. So across our agency heads, every, every agency we have, even without legislation, every agency we have has got some part of their mission now that includes uh, one of the elements of the Main Street Initiative. So I know DOT to have, have a special fund 
that was talked about the Main Street Initiative, and the, and there are other agencies that have at least talked about yes, you know, doing some things. Yeah, the DOT, you know, in the past few years has spent billions of dollars in North Dakota. Even in a down year right now, they might be spending uh, six, seven hundred million dollars on road projects. If those road projects include us only building things which divert traffic around cities, we further erode the existing downtowns and main streets, and we create an environment which is more successful for out-of-state big box retailers. And so if we, how we design our roads affects our traffic patterns, which affects our property taxes, which affects how our local retail is, which affects how differentiated our communities are. Because if, we, if, if every community we have, if all we've got is fast food re restaurants and big box retailers that exist in every other community, then we are generica. Uh, we're the undifferentiated edge, and we, that doesn't allow us to recruit people because people aren't going to move here because we have the same thing they have someplace else. We need to be differentiated, and that differentiation usually occurs, you know, on the historic main street of a community, whether it's 400 people or, or 40,000. Well, Governor, unfortunately, we're out of time. We could go for a little long more on this. Yeah, well, Dave, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for all you do, and great to be on the show with you. Love to thank come back you. sometime. Let's do it. Our guest today, uh, Governor Doug Burgum. For Prairie Public and for North Dakota's legislature, I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us.